booktube and welcome to a new video my last for 2021 and this is going to be a wrap up of uh, various um, odds and ends that I've read sort of just in the lead up to Christmas uh, and in the period between Christmas and New Year which came after my uh, top 10 reads of the year none of which none of these books would have made it although a couple might have flirted with, uh, with just outside the chart um, so yeah it's really just a sort of uh, a wrap up of the second half of December really okay so the first of these is Anna Burns uh, Little Constructions uh, this was her second novel after No Bones her debut and Milkman which is the one you're most likely to have heard and um, this was crazy uh, it was quite cartoonish in uh, the way that Quentin Tarantino movies often are but don't be put off by that I mean I will say every single trigger warning it's possible to issue would need to be issued for this book, for, for the themes in it. But she's a remarkable writer, Anna Burns. You know, there aren't many women writers I can think of who, is, who write as brutally uh, about life and about their characters as she does. It's basically around uh, sort of five sisters um, who are part of a sort of a wider family uh, who are called the gang. I think the whole thing is is an allegory for, for the troubles in Northern Ireland. So although it's not directly, um, you know, cor correlating to that, I think that's what it stands for. And it starts off with one of the sisters marches into uh, a sweet shop come gun shop, which gives you an idea of the world that we're moving in here. It's a sweet shop, but it also sells guns. Uh, and uh, sort of asked to be uh, shown uh, uh, um, the most effective weapon they have. They sort of show her a Kalashnikov. She says, yeah, this will do. Throws down some money on the desk to pay for it and sort of snatches up some buckshot, which obviously doesn't work in a, in a Kalashnikov, and storms out of the, the shop uh, to go and settle a score with her lover. That's how the book starts, and, and it, it's, it very much goes on from there. There's a brutal scene about a woman being snatched from a uh, bus stop and raped on some waste ground nearby, which is treated as uh, a sort of a male rite of passage. So it's not only a rite of passage almost to sort of earn your spurs to enter the gang, but it's as if all men in this town, that is their rite of passage. As I say, she's absolutely brutal. This is more cartoony than poetic like Milkman was if you can deal with the subject matter I highly recommend it and to give you an idea of the sort of sense of humour at play one of the sisters is different from all the rest and uh, she recognises that she was traumatised as a child by incest uh, and, and physical abuse and um, she uh, enters therapy for it and her sisters get wind of this and they all march around to her house to demand that uh, she give up therapy because their concern is that all their dirty little secrets will be revealed. They don't care about her mental well-being. It's their concern about the family secrets. And the alternative to that is they issue what she describes as a death threat, by which they mean um, she should, uh, if she's not going to give up therapy, that she ought to commit suicide. I mean, as I say, absolutely brutal. 4.5 stars. And on to Rob Doyle, Threshold. Um, this is his second novel after Here Are the Young Men, although there's a book, collection of short stories in between. And he also produced a non-fiction work called Autobibliography, which was uh, a year uh, a year in his reading life. I haven't read any of those. This is my first Rob Doyle. I saw someone recommend it over Twitter. Sounded interesting. I've picked it up and read it. I will say, I think this is only for a certain type of reader with a certain type of interest. I think it's very male. It's about an artist and uh, uh, who leads a nomadic life, travelling through the globe, doesn't really want to sort of settle down, relationships, doesn't even really commit to his writing. And it, this is because he's very deracinated. He can't quite sort of come to sort of see himself as a sort of real uh, existence in the world. And he explores Buddhism, drugs, sex, art and literature, travel itself. But I found myself echoing a lot of what is in this book. That they're questions I've asked myself. As I said, I think they might be particularly male or male artist questions. Um, it'd be interesting if uh, women have read him uh, 
read this book and, and what they feel. But I actually found I, I, you know, I got an awful lot out of it where, where it resonated with me. And it's really well written as well. It is, it is quite sort of male in its attitude towards relationships with women. I repudiate everything to do with drug use in order to extend one's consciousness. So I didn't really uh, empathise with that, but it was still well written and stuff. Um, so I'm just going to read you a sample of um, of the writing. Um, so this is uh, when he's in Paris. Paris is widely known as the city of lights, but to me it's the city of condoms. Everywhere I looked I saw them. When I'd moved into my place by the park, a superlatively bohemian dwelling, it was falling apart basically, the young woman I was renting from while she was away in Mexico had evidently been in too much of a rush to clean up the bedroom. I knew this because of the large open box of condoms and the overfull ashtray on the bedside table, not to mention the clutter and dishevelment everywhere else. I didn't mind. In fact, I was pleased by it. This unwillingness to dispel the stereotype of the Parisian artist. The woman was a filmmaker. Languid sex, dubious hygiene standards, chain smoking. To me, the condoms and ashtray were like the suite that hoteliers leave on the pillow for when you check in to a room. A welcoming touch. It is well written. Uh, it, the comparison I would make, although I think this is far superior, is Ben Lerner's Leaving the Atocha Station, which is the first Ben Lerner novel I read. I liked it at the time, but having since read other Ben Lerner novels, the characters there all seem very self-indulgent. Uh, this character could equally be seen to be self-indulgent because he, he's not really committed to his writing and stuff. But, I, you know, I was won over by this. There's a lot of writers who are uh, sort of, uh, you know, it makes me quite interested to read his autobiography. So he quotes E.M. Uh, I think his name is Gioran, sort of Romanian who relocated to Paris, who wrote in aphorisms. Um, Georges Bataille, um, Camus is in there. Um, uh, who else does he? Oh yes, uh, Roberto Bolano. He sort of visits some of the shrines and 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 sort of where these pe where these people are buried and stuff. Um, so there's a lot about literature and presumably the literary influences on Rob Doyle. I mean, I think this is quite heavily autobiographical. But as I say, it won me over. Uh, unlike Vladimir Sorokin, who's a Russian author called The Blizzard, I saw um, Trouble Through Stories talking about a big work of Sorokin's, uh, which I think was in three not three volumes, which he's looking to get to read in 2022. I'd never heard of this author. I certainly didn't want to start with these three massive maximalist books. So I saw what was shorter, and this was one. I picked it up. Um, it's as if Tolstoy wrote steampunk. Uh, it's a road trip, only being Russia and called the blizzard. There is no road because it's buried under snow and ice. And again, being Russia, it's not done in a car or a motorised vehicle. It's done in a sled pulled by miniature horses. And there's a lot of sort of playing around with a scale of both humans and animals. There are giants. There's uh, sort of miniaturised, you know, not even dwarf, but literally miniaturised uh, millers. The hot, the, you know, there's giant horses. There's miniaturised horses. I couldn't really see to what end. I don't know if this was... You know, I'd sort of hoped that it was going to be a parable for modern Russia. And in fact, it's, as I say, it's steampunk. It's, it's, it has the feel of the 19th century, although it is definitely sort of 20, 21st century vibes. Uh, just the technology is, 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 is sort of 19th century. But I couldn't really see to what end. I mean, I, I didn't really get anything out of this book. But having said that, I have bought uh, another one of his books called Day of the Oprogenic, which I think is more of a satire on contemporary Russia in the vein of some of Victor Pelevin's novels. So, you know, this hasn't put me off this. I just picked the wrong book in that. Uh, so I gave this two and a half stars. Uh, Dennis Johnson, Fisco, Fiscadoro, which is his second novel, written in 1985. Uh, I have sort of pledged to read all of Dennis Johnson's novels. I've read six. I think I've got three more now. Um, he's died, so he won't be producing any more. Um, this is a sort of post-nuclear holocaust, uh, almost back to the Stone Age society in the Florida Keys, made up of sort of competing villages. 
who live off the uh, off the catch of fish from the ocean. Um, they're sort of outside of the sort of pollution zone, just about. Although they're in quarantine um, from the Cubans, who seem to be the most powerful entity left in the world. Um, and each of these sort of different villages has uh, different uh, theologies. Uh, you know, there's sort of Rastafarianism. Uh, there's sort of a sort of shamanism. There's uh, Christianity. There's uh, voodoo. And each of them are waiting for to be clear to have the quarantine that Cuba will come and save them. But also their their particular messiahs, be it Bob Marley or Jesus Christ or or whoever will come and save them as a messiah so that's the sort of the frame of the book i'm not really sure i mean you know it's 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 a dystopian society i don't think it's you know particularly interesting uh it seems to be harking back to the vietnam war because one of the characters is the oldest woman left surviving in the world who's over 100 years old who was constantly replaying how she got out of saigon made it to america so I think there's some sort of linkage going from Vietnam through to the nuclear holocaust. This was written in 85 when we were still labouring under sort of concepts such as mutually assured destruction and, and things like that. It was definitely a sort of nuclear uh, Damocles sword hanging over the world, which hasn't aged well. Uh, I'm not saying the nuclear threat no longer exists, but it, in the context of this book, I don't think it's aged well. And also... The dystopian side where, you know, it's a big cast of characters, there's different societies with different sort of divinities. So you've got all that stuff. And then it seems to be about, you know, the, the through line is is war from Vietnam through to the nuclear holocaust. We don't, we don't know exactly how this nuclear holocaust happened. You know, who caused it? Was it the Americans? Was it the Russians? We don't know. Chinese? We have no idea. So those two didn't mesh up very well either for me. Uh, I will say one of the interesting things it does is about memory, because this, this old woman, you know, she has the longest memories, the furthest back in history of anyone in the world, which is interesting, whereas one of the, whereas Fiscadoro, the, the, the uh, character who's a, who's a youth, has his memories wiped by a sort of shamanic drug ritual um, and loses all his past memories and can only now, you know, once he's recovered, can only now um, retain current memories. Uh, and recent memories so that was kind of interesting which is why I give it three stars but it wasn't a great success to be honest and on to some non-fiction this is Paul's Boutique by Dan Leroy Paul's Boutique is uh, the Beastie Boys second album the follow-up to the hugely successful but you know frat boy toxic masculinity of License to Ill the Beastie Boys completely reinvented themselves to the point where they left their their uh, native New York to go and hang out in Los Angeles and it's it seems to do them good uh, you know I'm a huge Beastie Boys fan I have read the massive uh, autobiography by the two surviving members Ad Rock and uh, uh, um, Mikey um, Mike D Mikey Diamond um, and this didn't add a lot, even though my, you know, I love this book and the one criticism, I, and I'll post my link to the review of it, my one criticism of it is it didn't delve into enough detail for each of the albums, which is exactly what this sh does for this one particular album. But actually I felt it was dominated by the people who made the album possible around the Beastie Boys, like the Dust Brothers, who are the producers who came up with all the samples and a guy who was attached to them, and the guy at uh, Capitol Records who, who basically gave them the record deal because they, they wanted desperately to leave uh, Def Jam, which was the label for their for License to Ill, because they felt they weren't treated properly. So we get all these characters around the fringes. Well, uh, more than around the fringes, but only one Beastie Boy, which is um, Mike D., uh, ever really sort of get quotes from him, which, you know, at the time... Uh, Adam Yelch had not died. He died uh, this decade, whereas this was written in 2005, this book. So they, could, they didn't get anything from him. They didn't get anything from Adam Horowitz except what's in the public domain already. So I didn't learn a huge amount uh, from this book, which, which is a bit disappointing, I feel. But, you know, it's pretty good on, you know, the, where a lot of the samples came from. This, is, this album possibly has the most samples 
uh, because the laws changed on on you know sort of getting clearance and permission, having to pay for them, so that an album like this could not be made now because it's just prohibitive to get all the samples cleared. So they reckon there are at least three hundred sampled uh, bits of other people's work in it, and and you know it, it, there is a whole debate which is touched on here about sort of artists copyright and, and things like that. I have read another one in the series, 33 and a third. Um, this is The Ghetto Boys by Rolf Potts. Um, again, not so interesting on the on the album itself, but th this gives a very good background overview of the state of hip hop when this album was produced was released in 1990, uh, where it's beginning to sort of emerge from New York, and you've got the gangster rap on the West Coast, and and the Ghetto Boys are from Houston, so it's like Southern hip hop. It, they they were the first real breakthrough uh, Southern hip hop artists, apart from Two Live Crew from Florida. Where this book also talks about this, the censorship and Typical's uh, parents' music resource center, which wanted to sticker a albums that were offensive and obscene you know to protect the children all that sort of stuff so it's quite interesting in its background less so on on the art itself and finally physical a collection of poems by um andrew mcmillan which i saw on bob the booker's channel um and uh andrew mcmillan is a gay writer and this this collection is split it's a very short collection it's only about 50 odd pages split into three parts. The first I loved, it was about the sort of the physicalness of the male body through a queer perspective, but just that sort of physical, some of the images were fantastic. There's a poem here called Urination, which is brilliant. <laughs> uh, the second part was all one long poem, and then the third part was a bit more of a, a sort of a mixture. So pre pretty strong. I wasn't so taken with the, the middle part, but four stars. Uh, I ought to say, I suppose, uh, that uh, the Paul's Boutique, I think I gave three and a half or four stars. The Ghetto Boys, I'd give four stars. I have also read, um, but I'm not going to talk about, because um, it was quite a while ago and it didn't leave me with any great impression. Uh, the poetry Collection of Season in Hell by Arthur Rimbo, uh, written when he was very young, uh, a bit overwrought. Um, yeah, I haven't really got anything to say about this. So that's it. Uh, that is my final reads of 2021. Tomorrow is the 31st when this video will go live. I'm not planning on reading anything tomorrow because I am uh, writing, hopefully. Uh, but I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody who has supported me by watching my videos, commenting, um, you know, having conversations below the line on YouTube, but also on Twitter uh, through 2021. I'm very, very grateful. Um, it's, it's a great sense of satisfaction when someone says, I, I, you know, because of what I've said, they're going to, uh, you know, chance their arm on a book. Uh, I, you know, I don't get any money for, for selling other people's books by recommendation. Uh, but it still gives me a little tingle when someone sort of says, oh, right, that sounds interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. So that, for me, as a, as a sort of maker of book reviews, I think that's the greatest pleasure I can get. So thank you to everyone who's commented, as all viewed, um, subscribed, you know, whatever the markers are. Um, and, you know, here's to 2022. Till next time. Thanks very much.